Hello, welcome to La Excellence. I am Harsha Manava and I teach Anthropology at La Excellence. So in the previous video, I hope I aroused your curiosity on this book and how it's very relevant to all of us. Today we'll make a beginning into some of these ideas. I'll take up the first chapter today. It's called An Animal of No Significance. It's very, very interesting. Let's explore what are these interesting ideas we find here. First. A brief recap of what we did, if I have to put it in one slide, we said the entire human evolution is about 1.5 lakh years. Humans for the first time developed around 1.5 lakh years and this book tries to study this entire story of this 1.5 lakh years. We can break this down into three events, three major events. They are cognitive revolution, agricultural revolution and scientific revolution. Cognitive revolution is the beginning of when we developed capacity for language. Agricultural revolution is when we started doing farming, which is only 10,000 years old. And then we have scientific revolution, that is only four to 500 years old. That's when we began producing machines and industries. What is this first chapter about? An animal of no significance. What the title itself is self-explanatory actually. Harari is saying that Humans, when they first came onto the, this planet scene, that's about 1.5 lakh years ago, when they first evolved, they were not so special. Today, we are used to the notion that we are special because we control everybody else. But when they first evolved, they were very insignificant. They were not, their footprint on the planet was not so much different from either firefly, gorilla or jellyfish. So they were one among a myriad other fauna on this planet. Nothing particularly different, nothing particularly powerful about them. This is a very important point. So today we look at humans as if they are special, but when they evolved, they were not so special. And when did they evolve? They humans, modern humans, the Homo sapien evolved about 1.5 lakh years ago. But before we came like this, we had a few other cousins. They are our predecessors. They evolved something like 2.5 million years ago in East Africa, that's 25 lakh years ago. So Homo sapien, the modern human evolved 1.5 lakh years ago, but anything that is similar to modern man, not Homo sapien, but other species like Neanderthals or Homo erectus, these are also humans, but they are not Homo sapiens. How, how do we differentiate them? They also, unlike apes, which walk on all their four limbs, Erect walking man first appeared 2.5 million years ago from a species called as Australopithecus. So Australopithecus is the intermediate species between ape and homo or humans. And Australopithecus looks somewhat like this. So this is a painting of Australopithecus. And if you have to put a modern man, homo sapien and Australopithecus next to each other, they would look like this. This is Homo and this is Australo. It's just four foot, that's it. But what is special about this particular creature, this particular animal, it is walking on its two feet. Unlike apes, it looks largely like an ape. This the left, the picture on the left looks like a gorilla, isn't it? But unlike a gorilla, Australopithecus walks straight. So Australopithecus was our ancestor and from Australopithecus we evolved into Homo or humans have came up from Australopithecus. And if you have to trace this entire story of 
how humans developed from australopithecus through various other homo species and how did we finally come to homo sapien. So australopithecus looks like this and homo sapiens cranium looks like this. So to understand this change, this evolution, we focus on the cranium because the changes in the cranium are the most significant and when we understand how cranium evolved, the entire picture looks very, very simple. So we begin with Australopithecus which is a slightly an ape form but is walking on all its on two limbs, it is talking erect. Then you have other humans, other humans are not just homo sapiens, other humans include homo erectus, we will discuss some of them, homo erectus, homo neanderthals and homo sapien is what the term we give to ourselves but unlike us there were others also. So how do we understand this change, what do you see? In, as you move from Australo to Homo sapien, what are the changes do you see? They are very few. One, the brain is increasing in size, don't you see? The brain size here is just 440 cc, whereas here it is 1300 cc. Next, what else is happening? The face is projected, the face has a projection for Australopithecus, it is front, there is a front projection. But by the time you get to Homo sapien, you get a flat face. That's the other important change. What else? The third most important aspect has to do with the jaws and teeth. The jaws and teeth of Australo are slightly big. You see massive jaws, don't you? But when you look at Homo's teeth and jaws, they're smaller. They're not so massive compared to Australopithecus. So that is the other most important change. So what are the changes? The cranium. Yes, that is the most important, the brain size has been growing. Next, the face becomes flat, third, the jaws and teeth have become smaller. So this change defines human, this is how Homo sapien is different from other apes and other intermediate human species. So how did this whole journey happen, fine yes, we evolved about 2 million years ago, not we. We came about Homo sapien is 1.5 lakh years ago, but 2 million years ago modern humans, not mo humans first evolved and from there, where did they evolve? They evolved in East Africa and from there they spread to rest of the planet. How did they spread? You can, the spread can be imagined in this picture. This is a very good depiction of how those events unfolded. So there was first in East Africa, from there they moved to Arabian Peninsula, from where they, one branch moved towards Asia, another branch moved towards Europe. Within Asia, some populated the Indo, uh, Indian Peninsula, some moved to China and some others went to Indonesia. From Indonesia, they moved to Australia and from China, some moved to Siberia and from Siberia, they entered the North America and then spread to South America. So South America was last populated by Homo sapiens. And we are also used to this, the other important idea that Harari tells us is that we Homo sapiens have a sense of exclusivity. We think we are alone. Other animals have many other uh, related species, cats, you see many variants of cats, apes, there is chimpanzee, there is gorilla, there is gibbon, orangutan, likewise dogs, whole range of variants. But when you look at Homo sapiens, you are used to assuming that, we are used to assuming that we are alone, we are powerful and that is a, a source of lot of hubris. But Harari tells, see boss, for a long time, we were not alone, they were some other species that looked just like us. So we had siblings, Homo sapiens had siblings, there were other species that looked just like us. And these species were in different parts of the world, some in Europe, some in Africa, some in Asia and each species adapted to its local conditions. One variant lived in Europe, Europe is cold, so it developed adaptations to cold climate. Another variant lived in Africa, tropical, humid and hot. So this species developed adaptations that suited African climate and so on. So 
they were at least if you looked at this planet earth about 5 lakh years ago you would have seen at least six different species of homo we were not just alone at least six different species were coexisting what are those six different species we can these are some indicative most important species homo neanderthals homo neanderthals homo is the genus neanderthals is the name of the species so each species is given a latin name now the name is given in latin and each name has two components one is their genus the other is their species genus is homo species is sapiens so homo neanderthals is the homo variant that ad adapted in europe it was massive they had stronger muscles broader body all to suit the uh, cold european climate homo erectus is the asian variant you find fossils of the species in china and indonesia then on java island you have homo soloensis then on flores island on indonesia you have another species called homo floresiensis now there is a very interesting uh, story about this particular homo floresiensis i'm sure you will also enjoy it so what happened was some homo sapiens walked into indonesian islands at that time it was ice age so the seas were frozen so you could easily move between islands you just had to walk on ice so some of these walked down to an island and when they were living there suddenly you saw the temperatures rose again the ice melted and sea levels rose so when they crossed over to the island there were land bridges the frozen ice frozen seas but by the time they wanted to cross again the ice melted away and there was no way they could swim across the oceans so they were stranded on islands and on this particular island flores it's a resource short island so there were very few resources so very difficult to make a living there and of the all the species who crossed onto that island only those who were short survived all those who were big and you know tall with big bodies found it difficult to support their massive bodies with the limited resources of this island so over a period of time only those who were short survived short short and lightweight survived and over a period of time all the individuals that lived on this island were dwarfs so homo floresiensis is a dwarf variant of homo species how tall were they just 1 meter and what was their weight they were just 25 kg just imagine somebody just 1 meter height and weighing 25 kg a child weighs more than that so this was the variant that you found on this island and to their uh, credit it's not just flora the human species on that island which were dwarf variant even elephants on the island were dwarfs so across spectrum i think most animals which survived on this island given its uh, food scarcity conditions were those which were short and which had lighter bodies next in siberia we have what is called as homo denisova this was in news last year this particular fossil and there was a question in prelims also last year prelims because they found usually denisovan man homo denisova is assumed to be found to be found only in siberia but last year they found some fossils of denisova or some genes of this denisova in tibet that caused lot of discussion and curiosity in scientific circles then there is homo rudolfensis in lake rudolf area homo ergaster for africa so this is how various species developed as adaptations to different climatic conditions and if you build if you have to reconstruct those extinct species extinct human species they would look like this in fact they are not very different from some of the human variants right so they were very close to us but we were more sophisticated in the sense that we had larger brains but they were not very different from us and next so what is the point we made so far first we said humans 
when they evolved that is to humans not homo sapiens humans evolved 2.5 million years ago whereas homo sapiens evolved 1.5 lakh years ago so there is a difference when humans evolved the first idea we are saying is that they were insignificant they didn't have much impact on the environment second now we are alone only we only have home one variant of humans but about 500000 or 1 million years ago there were at least six species of humans that coexisted one species did not uh, survive and command others there were at least six species and third the third idea is that most of the time we imagine there was one species that species gave rise to next that species gave rise to next and then next so we have some sort of linear evolutionary model that there was species 1 a a gave rise to b b gave rise to c and c gave rise to d this is the common idea right you would have thought australopithecus gave rise to homo erectus homo erectus gave rise to neanderthals neanderthals gave rise to homo sapiens this is a common myth that many of us hold but that's not true the reality is more complicated if there was a along when a was existing b developed when b was existing c developed while c and b were present d developed when d was developing a was slightly fading out a was becoming extinct so it is not a linear model this model is wrong this is correct so what is the exact evolution there was one species a then while this was existing another species came on to the scene b when b was there c came into c when c was there both b and a also existed and when d came on to picture a was slightly exiting the picture a was moving towards extinction so this is how the events unfolded it was not that one gave rise to another and became extinct the moment b came a didn't become extinct a was there the moment c came b and a were still there when d came probably b and c were there and a was also there but dwindling numbers they were moving towards extinction so this is how it happened so this is a picture of two widely accepted models of evolution see the problem with something like this is that we are start trying to study something that's 2.5 uh, million years ago so we are not very sure how it folded unfolded so we have various hypotheses based on the fossil evidence we gather so it's not like somebody shot all those events on a high definition camera and gave us to us right we found some bones we found some tools and we are trying to speculate how things might have happened based on that so we will never know the exact sequence of events but we will only have an overall picture so based on that there are two hypotheses a and b about how the various species are unfolded now the exact details are too much for us not needed but i just thought i will take these two pictures and give you an idea of how the evolution is understood in scientific circles before we move on to the next idea you have to understand one more important uh, concept so we said there were various species right and we ourselves are how many years old not i not my age but the age of the homo sapiens homo sapiens is like we said 1.5 lakh years isn't it but humans are 2.5 million years ago while we are 1.5 lakh years old there is one fossil called homo erectus this is what you largely find in asia homo erectus has the largest lifespan of all humans homo erectus survived from 2 million years to up to 200000 years ago that is from 20 lakh years ago to 2 lakh years ago so homo erectus had a lifespan of nearly 18 to 20 lakh years so homo erectus has been the longest living human species on this planet it is not us we may have had the largest impact on the planet but we are not the longest living species we are not the longest living humans the longest living humans are who homo erectus but you may say sir we have we may have future we are just 1.5 lakh years but we may have a long future but many scientific studies say that is an overestimate our best shot we may have only about 
thousand years more. Given the kind of environmental destruction we are doing, Homo sapiens may have at most about thousand years. So, something like another lakh years is beyond our range. It's out of our league. So, Homo erectus was the most successful in the sense that it lived for the longest on this planet. It was not Homo sapiens. Next, in that earlier figure, I told you that what is so important about humans is the large brain, isn't it? See, of all the three, we have the largest brains. And across animal kingdom, for any species, for a species of given weight, and if you compare the weight to the body ratio, humans have the largest brain for the given body weight. Of course, elephants may have a bigger brain, but they also have a larger body, isn't it? So, if you make a ratio of brain weight to the body weight, humans have the largest brains. Neanderthals had slightly more, but human brain, apart from being the homo sapien brain, apart from being large in size, also had different composition. That made them much more smarter. Of course, now you might say, yes, we have brains, we are intelligent. But if brain was such a uh, luxury, other animals also must have picked it up, right? The reason brain didn't develop such a large brain is rare in animal kingdom is that jumbo brain is a jumbo drain on the body. A large brain is a big brain because brain cons consumes so much energy. Take a human brain for example. It's just 2-3% two, two to of the body size but it consumes 25% of energy. So brain is like a fuel guzzler. It's like maintaining a sports car, a Lamborghini, a middle class man does not have, even if he's gifted a Lamborghini or a Ferrari, does not have the money or resources to just fuel it. So, brain is a very, very energy consuming organ. So, archaic humans, when brain developed, what happened? They had to spend more and more time sourcing food because the brain consumed a lot of food. And not just that, since a lot of their food went towards brain, their muscles started becoming weak. So, their muscles atrophied because they could not uh, maintain a large brain and strong muscle simultaneously. There has to be a trade-off and the trade-off was in favor of the large brain. The second thing that defines humans is that, I, I've been telling this, is that they have an upright posture, isn't it? We walk straight with just two legs and our hands are freed, isn't it? We don't use our hands for uh, motion, only our legs are helping us move. A freed hands gave us a lot of benefits and the chief benefit was that freed hands were used to now make tools. Humans are the only animals that intentionally make tools for specific purposes and we could do that because our hands became free since we started walking upright. This freed our hands and enabled us to make tools which gave us edge to survive against other animals. But of course, this is the upright posture is a very, very important development. Please, please make note of this. But it's not like this upright posture was without its share of problems, isn't it? It certainly had some problems. What are they? For example, on an ape or any animal which walks on all its four limbs, the weight is distributed evenly on all the four limbs. You take a dog or you take a chimpanzee, gorilla, elephant, their weight is supported by four, four limbs. But in humans, the entire body weight must be supported by just two limbs. That is the reason you see higher incidence of back pain, arthritis, uh, worn out knees, stiff neck. So, our erect posture has also caused us some health problems. Those are these. So, these are some events of maladjustment. We got upright posture since it gave us benefit, but it was not without its share of troubles. But uh, women in particular had to face a lot of difficulty due to this upright posture. What was that? Now let's rewind a few seconds back. We said humans had big brain, right? So one, there was big brain. Second, we were up erect. Now this creates a very, very interesting problem. You like big brain, 
So a baby will also, when human baby is being formed, human babies were also having bigger brains, isn't it? Because big brain was selected. Now the issue is, if the brain of the baby is very big, how does the baby exit the mother's womb and how does it come out of the mother's body? Isn't it? If the brain is very big, if the brain keeps going bigger, doesn't mean that the mother, woman's hip is also growing proportionally bigger to allow for the baby to come out. That doesn't happen. Women's hips in general are wider compared to men, no doubt. But there is a limit. They can't creep, keep increasing with the brain size. So the problem is, one, you must have, the human must have bigger brain. But the brain cannot be so big that it cannot exit the mother's body. So how do you solve this problem? Natural selection gave a unique solution. That is, premature births. How does premature birth solve the problem? So instead of waiting for the baby to grow very big and leave the mother's body, in humans, the baby leaves the mother's body when it is relatively less developed. So before the brain becomes too big, the baby leaves the mother's body. Those are called as premature births. That's the reason, if you noticed, other animals, when they're born, they're not so helpless as a human infant. They take, they need the mother's support for, a, for sourcing food in the few initial few weeks, but they very quickly become independent. Birds, dogs, cats, any other animal. When it is born, it is relatively well developed. But human infant, the moment it is born, it is almost helpless. That is because, because we have bigger head. Since the head is big, the only way a big head could come out of a narrow woman's hip is if the baby was born at a very, very early stage in the development. So what is the uh, consequence of this? Unlike other animals, humans when they are born, they are like a molten glass taken from a surface. They have, they are like empty vessel. They grow and then they are not born with any inborn behaviors. Most of that behavior they develop through training. So, education plays a very important role in human survival. Other animals develop their behavior. Their behavior is a consequence of their genes. But in humans, human behavior is learnt. Because when you are born, you are helpless. The benefit of this is that humans can be educated in a range of things that other animals cannot be. So, we can be taught Christianity, we can be taught economics, we can be taught philosophy, we can learn sports, we can learn chess, we can forget chess, we can forget philosophy if you want to. So, all this is because humans are born almost helpless and much of their learning happens through their upbringing, what we call as socialization. So, human learning happens through socialization. Since a human infant is so helpless and is dependent on the mother, that leads to another unique problem. In another animals, the mother alone can raise its cubs. A tiger can, tiger, tigress can raise her cubs. But the human infant is so helpless and if a woman has multiple children, she, it's almost impossible for her, it's almost inconceivable that she can take care of all her children. She is, the mother now needs help. So that leads to some social institutions, marriage, a husband, his relatives and to help the couple, kinship develops, a set of relatives come into picture and the relatives together form tribe. So marriage, family, kinship develop because of the central, central biological limitation that human infants are helpless and they need support to be taken care of. So, the famous idea that it takes a tribe to raise a human. I hope you understood the idea. Do you see how elegant all this is? We needed big, big head. Big head, big brain allowed us to become very efficient. Great. But big head meant that we could, we could not exit the mother's body easily. So, what was the natural selection uh, solution out of the problem? It said, Humans should be born at a very premature level. Just be born at a very underdeveloped stage. But since the human infant is underdeveloped, how do we solve that problem? And it is underdeveloped and it is dependent on the mother. The mother has to take care of the helpless infant. 
that creates another problem. Now, how do you solve that? The solutions were social, social solutions like family, marriage, kinship, society, all of them came into existence. So see how one event led to another. This is how humans developed their culture. Next, despite all these benefits, having large brain, humans were still marginal for a long period. Despite developing tools, uh, moving, they were moving around as hunter-gatherers and their original occupation was scavengers. What is scavenging? Scavenging is not the same as hunting. Hunting came later. We became hunters much later. Hunting means you take tools, go after an animal or you trap it and kill it. But in the very beginning, humans were gathering some berries, some tubers, roots and eating them while also scavenging. Scavenging means uh, eating the remains of a dead animal. So let's say a bigger animal like tiger or a lion comes, kills a zebra, eats the meat it can and leaves the remaining bones. Humans would then go to the dead carcass, use their stone tools, which looked somewhat like this, use their stone tools, break open the bone and eat the bone marrow. So, scavenging was our original native niche. We were not in a capacity to kill other animals because we don't have claws. We don't have strong projecting teeth, sharp teeth. So humans, their natural uh, niche in the food chain was to scavenge. But due to brain development and due to uh, enormous progress in developing tools, we slowly began becoming hunters and from being in the middle of the food chain, we moved to the apex level. We became hunters, not because of our biological abilities like claws, but because of our tools. Very spectacular leap from middle to the top of the food chain. And this was a very, this happened, this change happened in a very slow, very short time. When other animals like lion and tiger became apex predators, their journey from the bottom to the top was gradual. The journey was part of the ecosystem's development. That's the reason the ecosystem had checks and balances. The tiger's movement to the top of the food chain was very natural, gradual, and ecosystem developed some balances to uh, tackle this movement. But human jump from middle to the top was so random, so quick, that ecosystem, the environment, did not develop checks and balances. That is leading to the current crisis. And humans are also very insecure about their position because we know that our natural biological abilities do not place us at that level. But through some technological, technological inventions, we got there. So we are always insecure about our position in the food chain. And that insecurity is the source of our cruelty. Harari compares humans to some banana republic dictator, a weak ruler like Kim Jong-un of North Korea, somebody who is not so very weak, but since he's got a lot of power, but because he's weak, he has insecurity and he now wants to still be in power. So he's somehow using all the available means to stay in power and that makes him very cruel. So Harari says, in the animal kingdom, humans are like that. Their position in the animal kingdom at the top is not in tune with their real abilities. That leads to insecurity and that insecurity leads to cruelty. That's the reason probably we are very cruel to other animals. Hunting, poultry, animal rearing, all of them involve huge violation of animal rights. We'll discuss them soon, don't worry. The next development was domestication of fire. Humans developed fire around 3 lakh years ago. So fire was domesticated around 3 lakh years ago. And this was a very, very, very important development. Fire, for the first time, gave humans some force that they could control. It gave them power over nature. No other animal could control nature. They could, at the maximum, at the best, they could adapt to nature. But humans, when they domesticated fire, they got control on nature. This had 
many benefits but the most important benefit of fire was cooking aha food so before there was fire our food sources were very limited we could only eat some berries and occasionally meat many other food sources were beyond us because our body could not digest it but cooking allowed us to process food this enabled us to eat a wider range of foods like potatoes almost all kinds of meat bones we could break open bones and cook the marrow so cooking exposed us open to us a wide range of food options this meant that humans now had more food at their disposal earlier you could only survive on some but when you can cook food you can eat so many other varieties which means more food was available and of course keep cooking kill germs and cooking also processed food so it was easier to chew and it took less time to digest the food because the food was partly processed already so it went easy on your digestive system now this part has another benefit earlier since we all ate raw food we needed a body used to uh, find it very difficult to digest it so we had a very long intestine to process the food but now since food was cooked the intestine became short great isn't it our intestine length shortened because there was no such demand for the for us to process the entire food and since the intestine became short the body could now use the saved energy to once again support brain's growth so intestine shortened whereas brain became bigger again but if you had both a long intestine and a heavy brain imagine how much food do we need to support it so cooking made our lives a lot simpler you can take the example of chimpanzees for example chimpanzees eat raw food so if you watch a documentary on chimpanzees or gorillas half the time they are awake they are eating that is because they need to constantly keep chewing keep chewing the raw food in order to get the minimum required nutrition to support their body but we don't need to do that that is because we can cook and just eat what is small amounts that is needed to support our energy demand the last idea of the chapter so if you go back to the initial part of the discussion we said humans had some siblings there were at least six species that lived on this planet now you may ask a very natural question right what happened to them why don't we find them anymore if there were six species in the beginning why are they not surviving today why are not why are they not alive today what happened to them is a very natural question here we have two theories two theories one is an interbreeding theory the other is replacement theory let me just there is so much debate in the uh, scientific circles on these two to put it very simply interbreeding means homo sapiens were superior than others so when homo sapiens walked out of africa into other parts of the planet they interbred there was mating and this mating led to dilution of the differences and it led to some kind of common genes and only one species the two became one because both of them were mating so the differences between these two started becoming diluted and whatever you have today is an outcome of interbreeding between the two variants so the two became one so when homo sapiens went to each of this different parts of the planet they mated there was mating with the local variant of human and over time this mating led to dilution of differences and eventually resulted in just one species the other theory is replacement theory replacement theory says that it was not some kind of mating but there was some genocide homo sapiens were much more superior and powerful so they used their power to exterminate and kill all the other species other variants of humans to eventually make sure only they survived so replacement talks about cruelty war genocide if this is true then probably homo sapiens had committed one of the first known uh, events of mass ethnic cleansing we hear about ethnic cleansing in various places right rwanda bosnia mass killings now in myanmar rohingyas some ethnic cleansing is going on so if this is true then ethnic cleansing probably began with 
humans wiping out other species before they began wiping out people of other cultures within their own community. But what is the reality? Today many think the reality is a combination of both theories. Maybe both things happened and there are some genetic studies which tell us probably there was largely replacement but to an extent there was also interbreeding. It was not probably mass killing everywhere. It was also probably some interbreeding with also episodes of extermination and genocide. Now before I finally conclude, I want you to think on a very interesting question. Let us for a moment imagine that if history were, were to unfold very differently, if what if Neanderthals survived? What if instead of us overcoming them, us eliminating them, what if Neanderthals also coexisted with us? How would our civilization be different? How would our societies be different? For example, would Jesus have died for sins of Neanderthals too and not just for sins of Homo sapiens? Would the Bible have been for both humans and Neanderthals and not just humans? Would Jesus have been worshipped by Neanderthals too? And would Neanderthals also have served in the armies of Roman Empire or would they have been part of the bureaucracies of Chinese and Indian empires? Would they have served the Mauryas along with humans? Would they have served the Qing and Ming dynasties in China? Who knows? Would the American Declaration of Independence, which for the first time talked about fundamental rights, would it have talked that there are rights not just for huma, humans but for all species? Would it have talked about, would it have said it is self-evident truth that all members of genus Homo are created equal and not just all members of the species Homo sapien. So, how would our discussion of fundamental rights be different? Would we have said rights of all species of uh, humans or rights of only Homo sapiens? Finally, would Karl Marx, Karl Marx gave the famous slogan, right? Workers of the world unite. Would Karl Marx have said, workers of all species unite? Would he have given that call? Workers across species, Neanderthals, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, all of you unite against the exploiting bourgeois. Would he have given that call? Interesting possibility, right? Please think about it and we will come back with the next chapter. Thank you.